Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Rachel Marshall from the Development Trust Association of Wales, and I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to this um, webinar uh, on behalf of our Enterprise Associations Programme uh, regarding recruiting and managing volunteers. Just a, a few little housekeeping things first. Um, our trainer, Anthony Brittle, um, will be the only one in the session today that's uh, got audio. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, if you could use the chat box uh, in your webinar tool to be able to type a question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm joined here with, with Kerry Thomas from the uh, Enterprise Solutions team. And both Kerry and I will field the questions and pass them along to Anthony, who can respond. And um, we're also recording this webinar and we'll be able to make the audio available afterwards through our website and also for our Enterprise and Solutions groups. We'll add them onto your base camp project area as well. And um, if you could just let us know initially, but again, by typing in the, the chat box, if you can uh, hear us properly, that will be really useful. Um, and just a little bit of information first about Enterprise and Solutions and Anthony before I hand over to him, who's going to deliver the session. So Enterprise and Solutions, it's our um, three-year big lottery funded programme. We're sort of halfway through the programme now, and it supports uh, communities right across Wales who have ambitions to set up um, their own community enterprises. And um, over the course of the programme, we deliver peer mentoring support to, to groups, as well as delivering a range of face-to-face -face and online events um, for people to, to take part in. So uh, today's webinar is the only second one that we've done of this type. So it's still fairly new for us and we're getting a feel for, for whether, how that's received across Wales. But we'd like to be able to offer more of these types of events in future. So your feedback is really valuable in that respect. We've also got a range of face-to-face -face, uh, learning events on topics such as governance for community enterprise, as well as best practice visits to see food enterprises in Stroud, um, and to see um, community development organisations in West Wales, for instance, coming up in September. And if you visit the DTA Wales website and look at the events page on there, you'll be able to join us on any of those um, other events. But as I say, it's a support programme, peer mentoring support programme for community enterprises. So we're joined today by a range of our client organisations who we're now working with across Wales using our network of um, locally based uh, coordinators and mentors. Um, we're delighted to welcome Anthony Brissot um, with us today. He has um, over 30 years of management and business experience, gained in a range of sectors, but uh, also within the third sector, working um, as a trustee and board member of various different charities, predominantly in South Wales and, and in Cardiff, including some of our member organisations like Pro Cymru and Brincanon Strategy in the past. He is an experienced consultant and trainer in various aspects of charity law, uh, strategic planning, business planning, and recruitment and HR issues. And um, we've asked him to come along today uh, to bring together his experience and management experience in terms of his knowledge of, of managing and recruiting volunteers for you. He also runs his own consultancy called Clarity Business Solutions that provides support to the charity and small enterprise sector. So um, bear with me and I'll just hand over to Anthony now. Sorry, they, they are saying the sound is a little intermittent. So I'm not sure. Can we do a little test and see if uh, they can hear you? Hello everyone, this is Anthony. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm wondering how well you can hear me. Okay. All right. So welcome to um, Development Trust Association Wales, DTA Wales. We're going to talk about recruiting and managing volunteers. Uh, just an introduction. I noticed that um, many of you on the list here are in organizations where you will almost certainly be using volunteers and maybe your volunteers yourselves um, and so you'll have a range of experience that I hope um, this session will simply enhance uh, with your knowledge and uh, help you move forward with, with some of your ideas okay I've got some PowerPoint slides to show you I will do my best not simply to read out what's on there I'll leave that to you I tend to talk around each of the key issues um, 
almost casually. So over the next half an hour or so, let's have a look at what we're going to do. Okay. As I say, the whole thing is an introduction, but my slide, the introduction, tells us more or less what we're going to talk about. We need to know about who it is out there, volunteers, and why. Uh, it might be you and I who are volunteers, and um, we know why we do it. I'm sure we're following that. You will be surrounded by people on your management committees and, and in your operational um, world who are volunteers. Why do we do it? Okay. Um, we will look at how the whole organization needs to be involved in managing volunteers. On the slide that I have, I say that if it's worth doing, it's worth managing. Um, many of you will be in situations where you've seen organizations, community enterprises, which simply allow volunteers to wander in and hang around and be there for hours on end without any clear sense of purpose, uh, without being managed in any way. Um, we want to move beyond that. We want to look at the law, some of the aspects of the law, and internal policies that go with the law. Okay? Talk about how we attract people to our organization as volunteers, how we recruit them, basic, some basic HR ideas in that. Creating a support framework. Well, what we're talking about is that um, the idea that managers ought to be creating the environment in which people can give up their best. So that environment um, relies on the support framework that we will help create within the organization. Recognition and reward. Why do people do it? Uh, we know that uh, from various studies that even paid employees are not always turned on, are not always uh, inspired to do their best because of the money they get. There are other factors that uh, motivate them. So we'll look at that in terms of um, volunteers. And finally, the benefits of volunteering to the volunteers themselves, to the enterprise, and to the, the wider community. What's it all about? Okay, if we can move on. First question is, who does it? Why volunteering? Well, there should be no stereotype. Really, it's uh, a wide range of people. Um, you know, <clears throat> it's you and I who volunteer. It's the people around us who volunteer in a range of settings over the years. Um, doing different things in different organizations over the years. My experience is primarily working as a, a member of management committees, a trustee or a director. Um, many of you will have similar experiences, but all of that is volunteering, um, young and old. There are no age limits to volunteers. It depends on what we're doing. Some people or have uh, come to the end of their professional careers and have a lot of experience, a lot of skills and knowledge. And they might be on the, um, excuse me, somebody filling in my, <laughs> my microphone here. Uh, they will have a lot to give. They will have spare time on their hands, maybe close to retirement. Or they may simply be people who do have a lot of experience, many years to go in the professional world, but still want to give something back. And then you will find them in the housing estates of the, the big cities. You will find them in the inner city areas. You will find them in the towns and villages throughout Wales and beyond. Any, any setting where there is a community enterprise will have volunteers, no doubt, or people who want to volunteer, and those who want to do it in the summer, when they're on holiday, or more frequently, uh, throughout the year, for example. Okay? Why do people do it? Why do you do it? Some people want to give something back. The 
they've had a wonderful experience of life in society, or perhaps not such a wonderful experience. And um, they are committed to a cause, for example. Um, we all know about social inclusion, social justice. Um, so the idea is that people can come and go in our organizations and offer a wide range of experience and gain experience, learn new skills, pick up new friends, colleagues, improve their employability. Employers love to see people who have volunteered, especially if there are gaps in their paid employment. People ask, what have you been doing between 2016 and 2017? There's nothing on your CV that shows that you've been working. Volunteering could fill that. Other people simply need to get out there and meet people and contribute, overcome boredom, okay? So people may be employed or they may be unemployed. They may be disabled and unable to work or they may be simply in between jobs, but they may have a motivation to come and talk to you and see what they can offer your company, your organization, and what you can offer them. Okay. The next question is, <clears throat> what is volunteer management all about? Okay, uh, looking at the bottom of the page, we, we see that I've said that if it's worth doing, it's worth managing. And I gave the example earlier of uh, volunteers just being on the scene with you in your war community enterprise in your organization without having much of a, a sense of purpose or a role. Well, we want to try and avoid that, okay? Um, we want to ensure that the organization that you have moves forward in the best way possible. And that means working with the people that you have in the best and most effective way possible, almost a professional way, okay? Many of you will be experienced at running things. Um, or if this is a new organization you're in, you might find that you and one or two others are doing everything. You're wearing multiple hats. You're running around uh, trying to achieve the whole thing on your own. It's possible that you could be facing falling out or getting very stressed and missing opportunities, missing ideas, making mistakes. If you can train volunteers well, they can help overcome these problems. They can be an extra pair of hands. They can be an extra pair of eyes. They can help you think through things and get things done, get more things done. There may be opportunities for you to use volunteering as a way of helping other volunteers and paid staff to develop for their own ideas. Volunteers ideally need a supervisor, somebody to whom they report, somebody to, take, to whom they take all their issues and problems to give them guidance and support. If you have a larger organization you're working in, that might well be a volunteer coordinator position. Okay? But it's important that the volunteer is not simply on the loose within the organization. We're talking about an organized approach. If it's worth doing, it's worth organizing well and maintaining that sense of um, organization, really, throughout the volunteer experience. It boosts people's morale uh, when they feel that they're in a structure that is designed for them to be there, that they are taken seriously. Okay, they can perform better, they can commit more, they will give you more goodwill if they feel they belong. So once again, if it's worth doing, it's worth managing. And we will later on refer to a way to get extra information on volunteer management. Where do we start? Initiation, 
within your organization. Who decides we need volunteers? And we need more people to volunteer. Okay. Ideally, um, the decision to create volunteer roles should be deliberate and well thought through. That decision should relate to the organizational goal. Do it for a clear purpose. The work of volunteers should contribute to the achievement of clear organizational goals. That's why the board or the trustees need to be involved. Engage them, you will get buy-in to the idea, they all get behind it and understand it, and you will design jobs or roles that volunteers need to be doing. Okay? We need to consider the law. The law governs everything we do uh, in buying and selling, which is what enterprises do. There are a whole range of laws that, that cover us quite specifically. And policy and procedure need to be uh, put in place within our organizations to show how we will implement the law throughout these issues. Also, when we consider policy and procedure, it gives us time to think things through. We think about what is it this organization wants to do? What are the risks involved? What are the uh, procedures that we need to implement? So the board needs to be involved in determining what policies are and how we implement these policies. We're going to talk about insurance a lot. Just mention insurance, okay? It may be employer's liability. Uh, even though we're talking about people who need to be working without pay, we, I think, need to explore the insurances that will cover them. It might be public uh, products liability. It might be professional indemnity. You need to take advice on these things. And there are a number of sources that you will see towards the end of uh, this uh, session where you will get that advice. We will cover job descriptions and person's specifications. Uh, you may wonder why it's there, but if you are going to create opportunities for volunteering and create roles, you need really to describe those roles, to understand what you're asking people to do. And you need, I believe, to determine the kind of person who you want to fill those roles, what their attributes might be, their qualifications, their experience, their knowledge. Basic HR, that's what we're looking at there. Volunteer agreements, it sets up the common understandings between yourself, the community enterprise, and the, organized, and the volunteer himself or herself. If somebody's going to turn up every Wednesday morning or every Sunday evening or whatever it is to do something for your organization, what are the expectations on both sides? Then we're talking about, again, creating the environment in which people can feel comfortable, feel safe, and be effective. A support framework. It involves the whole organization Okay, so starting from the top to the bottom, the board of trustees need to be involved. They need to ensure that everybody in the organization is on board and has a role. Okay, these factors need serious consideration when you're planning. It's a whole organization approach that will impact your enterprise for the long term. Now let's look in more detail at some of those factors. The law. I've just chosen four. There, undoubtedly, there, there are a whole range of, of laws uh, that cover our behavior in work. And we are talking about work, uh, whether it's payroll or not. You're, you're actually performing something that could be risky for people, can be dangerous. So let's look at the Health and Safety of Work Act, 
1974, as you know, um, it will have been updated, updated numerous times since then. But what we've got defines the fundamental structure and the authority for the encouragement, regulation, and enforcement of workplace health, safety, and welfare within the whole of the United Kingdom. Now, it is true that the legal obligations of organizations um, that don't actually pay people, they're not employers, they're using volunteers on their own, the obligations of those organizations with regard to health and safety issues are less clear than they are for organizations that employ people. Nevertheless, a community enterprise does have legal obligations to its volunteers. And it is good practice to treat volunteers with equal consideration when it comes to health and safety. Your organization does need to ensure that your volunteers work in a safe environment where levels of risk have been reduced to a minimum. So many of you will be familiar with uh, risk assessments where you, for every new activity or situation in which you're going to put a worker, whether it's a paid worker or a volunteer, you need to do an um, assessment of the hazards and what risk they pose. And you need to try to minimize the risks that those hazards pose, basically. Let's look at the Consumer Rights Act. All organizations, all social enterprises will be buying and selling. They will be trading. They will be making money. Okay. Um, but the Consumer Rights Act relates to the rights of customers, be they businesses or individuals. It replaces three pieces of legislation. You will remember the Civil Goods Act, the Unfair Terms in Consumer Contract Regulations, and the Supplier Goods Act. Well, they've all been brought together under the Consumer Rights Act 2015. It makes things simpler, and it gives us clearer shopping as customers, your organization will need to uh, bear in mind the regulations of the that. Then you have the Trade Descriptions Act 1968, which is designed to prevent manufacturers and you may be making things, retailers, or those in the service industry from misleading customers as to what they are spending. So you will have to be careful, even if you see yourself as an entirely volunteer organization. You'll be interacting with the public in some way, either serving or selling or manufacturing. The Data Protection Act, again, most of you will know that this has been updated lately, 2018. And it controls how your personal information is used by organizations like yourselves, businesses, and the government. Everybody responsible, responsible for using data has to follow strict rules called data protection principles. They are designed to protect personal information. Now, that's not an inclusive list. And you can see uh, DTA in Wales. Wales Council for Voluntary Action for further advice. Then we look at policy and procedure. We need policy, internal policy within our organizations that matches the laws that govern us, that allow us to implement what the law says at the local level, at an organizational level, a procedure that will go with each policy. Okay? We need, for example, Policies on volunteering, on safeguarding, on EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion, health and safety, and long working. Many of you will be in situations where you do have people who are working on their own in isolation at various times. Okay. 
policy on data protection, procurement, how we buy things, uh, any of our organizations have uh, very strong ethical um, principles. And we choose not to buy from things that we consider bad to society. So um, procurement policies. Recruitment and selection, uh, again, we want to ensure that we are, and everybody in the organization understands how it is that we attract volunteers or staff, paid staff, and how we treat them within. Okay? Training and development, what's in it for our staff and our volunteers? Where can they go once they fill a position in your organization? You'll need industry-specific policies. For example, um, depends on what your operation is. It may be that you're running a community bus scheme, or it may be that you're running uh, a community garden, or a cafe, or a community hall. Whatever it is, there will be industry-specific policies that relate to So each of those policies show how the organization will apply the law within its operations. Those policies should be well thought out. Some will be fairly ge generic, but some will be specific to the industry or field of work that you're undertaking. You can find, I'm sure you know, a lot of model policies uh, on various websites. You can borrow policies from your neighboring uh, organization, but make sure that when you're tailoring to suit your organization, you are seriously considering what it is that your organization is doing, what it is that you're putting uh, your staff and your volunteers into in terms of uh, the environment and the situation. So setting policy and procedure should be something that the board is involved in, senior staff are involved in, and it should trickle down to every member of your organization. It gives you a chance to seriously consider what your organization is all about and what it's doing and all the issues that you may face. When you're developing your policies, consider the latest good practice in the field. See, consider how you can benefit the volunteers and the staff, the customers and the wider community. Make sure that you try to exceed what the law requires as a bare minimum standard of performance. Go over and above, go the extra mile. Some of these examples here are as follows the volunteering policy. Okay. If you involve volunteers in your organization, you're advised to have in place a volunteer policy. Having this policy can provide your organization with a framework for establishing a volunteering program, or in other words, um, it's a framework for everything that that volunteer does. Bearing in mind that you might be one of those volunteers, you yourself, even if you're the chairman of a, a small board of uh, management, should be in a framework um, that supports your work, that gives a reason for your work and moves your organization forward. So it is a detailed statement about what your organization is all about, the values and principles of your organization, and how that volunteer can contribute to taking your organization forward, where that volunteer fits in the overall scheme of things. It will talk about how you attract people to your organization, recruitment, selection, how you determine which person fits, fits which role. It will determine how you uh, identify training needs for an individual and development needs for an individual and help them move forward in their lives as well as in the operation that you're, you're running. The policy will talk about the management of the 
all on skin. It's not rocket science. It's about how we deal with complaints and problems and um, ensuring the well-being of that individual volunteer whilst they're with us. Okay, Who does the volunteer go to when they have an issue, when they have a query? It talks about volunteer rights and responsibilities. Everybody wants a say, and they should have. And what we're talking about is how we can actually give them that formal provision for expression. Making sure that they're not out of pocket when they come here to, to work with us on a wet, rain, rainy uh, Tuesday afternoon to do something for us. Volunteer expenses. That might be travel, it might be lunch, it might be um, clothing. How and what will you pay for? What are the procedures for um, claiming those payments? Finally, recognizing the volunteer. Um, we talked about uh, people's motivation earlier, but I think that if you thank people genuinely, they feel good about it. And you want to make sure that your volunteers feel good, wanted, respected, and appreciated. So how do we do that? We'll look at that a bit later. Okay, right. Moving on. Safeguarding. Those of you who are already in work will probably have covered this. And we're talking about the protection of children and vulnerable adults. And there are two main acts that cover that. The Children's Act 2004, and the CARE Act to bring vulnerable adults, 2014. But social enterprise, the community enterprise, and everyone in it, including your volunteers, have a legal responsibility to ensure that children and vulnerable adults are safe and come to no harm, that's physically or emotionally. Now, voluntary work in community enterprises community enterprises and organizations like ours often attract vulnerable adults. Some will come with a care act. In other cases, the organization itself will become the carer when that individual starts working with you. So there needs to be effective safeguards in place within the organization before volunteer positions are offered. Each organization will need to appoint a safeguarding officer with specific duties if you're going to be working with children or vulnerable adults. There will also be a need to raise staff awareness of the topic through training. Now you put these measures in place before going ahead with recruitment. So please refer to uh, your local CVCs or uh, research the internet for guidance Get some information on it. It's a vital topic, okay? Again, you're probably familiar with the concepts of EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion. We're talking about people who may be organizations, maybe anywhere in Wales, rural or urban, okay? We want to ensure that all volunteers are treated fairly as we want to be treated ourselves. We want equality and no less favorable treatment. And we want to ensure that our specific needs are catered for. We have to recognize that each of us is different um, with a variety of abilities and skills and aptitudes and cultural understandings. So there's a whole list of um, issues there, or factors, race, ethnicity, national origin, and so on. Inclusion means that we want to get the best out of society, and we want society to get the best out of us. So it means actively engaging and promoting opportunities to a wide variety of potential volunteers. And that happens throughout the communities in which we work. We want to open the door and actively encourage people to come.
come through it, to engage them in ways that make them more likely to engage with us. Again, now we're looking at standard HR practice with job descriptions and person specifications. Um, I've got down the bottom there. If jobs are worth doing, they're worth describing, along with the necessary attributes of the people who should do them. So when we're talking about job descriptions, we're looking at something that describes the job that you're creating or advertising. It's title, tasks, duties, roles, responsibilities, reporting, and so on. Then you need to specify for yourselves the kind of person who you think will fit into this role. Do they need qualifications? Do they need specific skills or abilities, knowledge, experience? You can define those in relation to the actual job itself. But that also then brings us back to the starting point. If you're going to create job opportunities, then you have to have in mind what it is you want people to do. And so you design those jobs to further the aims of your business. It is a strategic approach. Okay. Volunteer agreements. They're not legally binding. We trust people to do what they understand needs to be done. As users for of volunteers, we need to be trustworthy. We need to be constant communication with people about conditions as they change and what is expected of them. And likewise, we open up the ability, the channels for the volunteers to communicate with us in the same way. This volunteer agreement can be changed by agreement as you go along, but it should define what can be expected of both parties. It should set out the organization what are we all about? And where does this volunteer fit into it? Reporting arrangements, training, meetings. Again, you can see all of those things there. Health and safety, equality, confidentiality. There are sample volunteer agreements with the WCBA, and I would advise that you take a look and tailor your volunteer agreement to your situation. Recruitment itself, how do you attract people? Well, you can promote your opportunities with committee open days. Let people come in uh, and see what you're doing. In taster days, for example, spend several hours with you and your staff and your other volunteers so that people get an ex experience of what you're doing they like it or whether you like them. Yeah. You can advertise directly with CBCs and volunteer centers, bureaus. You can advertise social media, on social media, Facebook, and so on. Ideally, you will formalize an interview process. So it's not a nod and a wink when you take somebody on. You sit them down and you match their um, skills and experience and, and their performance with a person spec and a job description. Your appointment may be formal using the volunteer agreement. You may have a trial period. Again, all of this is, it's, when I say it's non-binding, non non-legally binding but you want to work with trust. You want to create a framework where people can trust. So there will be a trial period to say, well, okay, let's see how it goes for the next month or the next three months. See how we get on with each other as an organization and as a volunteer. Ideally, as I've said, you invite, you, you will appoint a supervisor from within your current group staff or volunteers, somebody who will be there 
for the volunteer to refer to. If you're larger, a volunteer coordinator where you've got loads of volunteers coming and going. But also create more than one way to volunteer. Okay. Um, I mentioned Facebook and social media, but if I wanted to learn a bit more, I might volunteer with an organization that actively puts itself out there on social media. And I would learn then how to do it myself. Uh, if I wanted to become a, a cook, a better cook, I might volunteer in the cafe for a while. They volunteer for various uh, opportunities. I might want to become a better typist or admin person, so I'll volunteer for office work. Create a variety of opportunities to attract a variety of people. This support framework, what are we talking about? Okay. We talked about the manager um, creating the environment in which people can give up their best. <clears throat> well, your organization is the manager, is the volunteer manager. So ideally, we need a clear job description. Show how the job contributes to the goals of the organization. You'll have a framework of policy and procedure designed to protect your workers and the customers and the community. Clear reporting arrangements, a learning plan, individual to the volunteers, with good induction. First few days, you spend time ensuring that they understand their, their setting, they understand the organization, they understand their role, they met everybody they need to meet. Okay? But also, every other staff member Every other volunteer in your organization needs to be aware, needs perhaps to be trained in how to relate to newcomers, volunteers, so that they can support them, so that they can develop teamwork. This is a whole organization approach to creating an environment. Almost finally, we're coming close to the end. Recognizing and rewarding. I feel good when people thank me for doing whatever I do, for, for my efforts. It makes me feel that what I did was worthwhile. It makes me feel that I'm better than I was yesterday. Okay? It helps me develop. It gives me empowerment. And I feel goodwill towards the people or the organization that has given me thanks, that has recognized what I have done. In the community, if we are rewarding volunteers, people will hear about it. Many of our volunteers live in that community. They pass good news on. And likewise, we pass bad news on even faster. So you want a good reputation. You want to be able to reward with for example, time credits, discounts perhaps of the goods and services that you're selling. There'll be social events, uh, perhaps once a month or whatever. You can have a night out with people. You can give people awards. You can give them certificates at the ceremony. You can have a, a fancy do and bring the press along and the community. And all of these things make a volunteer feel wanted, okay? They improve the experience, not end. Some of the benefits we talked about to the volunteer, the enterprise, and the community. Well, the volunteer may want to learn new skills, and you get, give them the opportunity to do that. It may be accredited, maybe not, okay? Give them a sense of empowerment, that their voice is being heard, that decisions are being made within the organization because they helped the organization think about it. They may have suggested something. Many will want to contribute to a cause, a medical cause or um, a social problem, to alleviate a social problem. It might just simply be poverty or it might be working with young people, alleviate um, 
by behavior in young people, giving them something of an inspirational outlook on life. Many will want to simply meet new friends and broaden them, their social network. And what do we get out of it as organizations, as enterprises? When we get that injection of new skills, we get people who can do what we couldn't do before. They bring new experience and skills to the organizations. It helps us contribute to the community as well as us. We don't exist in isolation from our communities. This is a way of bringing local people in and getting them involved. But many of our organizations only exist because we want to contribute to the community for reasons of social justice, etc. So we will be advancing organizational objectives. And what does the community get? Will they get better, better products, better services? The pub, is, the pub that you've taken over is still open for them to use. The post office is still there for them. The community bus service is there. The lawns are tidy. The people in the um, with big gardens are, are having their, their grass cut when they couldn't do it themselves. The community gets a service. But also because of your structure, because of um, your constitution, your ethos, people get a sense of ownership and empowerment. The community itself can help you move forward and have a say in who you are and what you do. And of course, some of their key problems might be alleviated when they've got extra volunteers in the youth club, when they've got extra people visiting the elderly or working in the schools and so on. So in conclusion, make sure that the whole organization, top to bottom, is involved in the creation and the management of volunteers. It's a strategic approach. It should be led from the top. Having a clear purpose, it will contribute to your strategic objectives. An organized approach, this is where I refer to Volunteer management manages national occupational standards. It will help you out. It will help you understand and implement good practice. So create a support framework that involves all of these policies, all of this training, all of this common understanding. Involve the whole enterprise and use that good practice. Talk to your talk to similar organizations about what they're doing, what they've done. Talk to the WCBA and the DTA in Wales. <clears throat> what is happening in this sector at this time? How can we sharpen our practice? How can we make ourselves more useful to our customers, to the community, and to those of us within the organization? How can we improve? So, a positive experience all around. Please enjoy it. Moving on, thanks for listening. You will see a link to two sites there. Um, they're both full of ideas and useful information. Please visit them. I'm gonna hand you back now to Rachel and Kerry.